<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Nikki, and um, welcome to our um, webinar this evening, which is on congenital limb deficiencies by John Amen. John works at the Evelina Children's Hospital, and he passed his exam in um, November 2020. So I'm sure he's going to make this <clears throat> complex topic um, very easy for us all to understand coming up for the exams. I'd like to welcome David, who's my uh, colleague teaching program convener for tonight's session. So just some general housekeeping. We're not too big this evening, but um, I'll ask you all to stay muted unless you're um, talking or contributing just to reduce the background noise. Um, I'll just share what the program for this evening is. Okay, so uh, we're going to have our lecture <clears throat> on congenital limb deficiencies. And if you have any questions, we'd ask you to write them in the chat and we'll ask them after the MCQ polls because some of those questions might be answered for the um, MCQs. After we've done the questions and the MCQs, then we will do some hot seat Viva practice with a maximum of three candidates. So if you're interested in the Viva, if you could raise your hand or send a message to myself or David um, so we can um, allocate those for you. Um, I do realise that the exams are only two weeks away. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a very stressful time. But this is the best practice um, that you can have is to be better to make mistakes in this part than in the actual exam itself. Um, OK, so. Um, <clears throat> we do have some upcoming courses uh, coming up. So we've got the mock exam course and we've got dates throughout the year. Um, we've got the case discussions course at various points as well. And we're also running our first basic sciences for the FRCS this weekend. Um, you can keep an eye on any relevant courses that are coming up on our website, which is orthopedicacademy.co.uk. And we are also available on social media. Um, so at the moment I'm recording this session and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, in a couple of days. So don't panic if you miss any part of it. I'll stop the recording when we start the vivas to protect your um, identities. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to John for our lecture. Uh, thanks a lot, Nikki. Uh, good evening, everyone. Actually, before I start, I just would like to thank everyone in this uh, fantastic group. Uh, I passed my exam in November 2020, and I have to say, without the help I got and the support I got from this group, I wouldn't have passed my exam. Um, so thanks to everyone uh, helped me to pass my exam. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm John Ehrman. I'm a senior fellow at the Villina London Children's Hospital, and I'm interested in pediatric orthopedics. Uh, so today we're going to speak about congenital limb deficiency. Uh, so, so basically, this is a, a tough topic. Actually, it's it's a very complex case. The reason we are um, we, uh, I choose that topic to do teaching for it today is because sometimes it come up in the exam. So I thought it would be better um, if we have a, like a resume of the topic and how to answer the questions in the exam. Uh, we'll try and keep it simple. We will not go into depth in these um, complex situations. You are not, you know, you, you don't need to be expert in managing these cases in the exam. Okay, so let's just start. So today, Okay, so today what we're going to do, so first we will discuss like a general approach to any PEDS case that you met in the exam, either in the VIVA or um, uh, in the clinical. And then we will start our topic by speaking about the embryology. I will speak about um, uh, the limb bud development, and then we will uh, discuss congenital femoral deficiency. And then we will discuss what happens in the knee in any case of congenital limb deficiency and what are the things that you should look for. And we will speak about fibular hemorrhage at the last thing in our uh, teaching today. So let's go. 
Uh, first, I would like to start with this clinical approach to pediatric cases. Actually, I used this approach in while I was preparing for the exam, and I thought it's useful. So for any case of pediatrics, you start by uh, taking history. So in history, uh, you usually ask about the complaint. The complaint in other cases is usually pain. In children, it may not be pain. And if it is pain, the, the key to know if this pain is significant or not is to ask if the pain is affecting the patient function or not. Like um, how do you do in their PE and their sport participation and all these kind of things. And then you, 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 you focus on the present history uh, and the present history, you should ask the patient if he had any previous treatment to his condition. And then in the past history, we all know about the prenatal, perinatal, postnatal history. In the postnatal, we ask about the developmental milestones generally. Uh, and it is very important to ask about the family history in any case, in any pediatric case, especially for uh, those conditions who are, have a genetic background or usually have um, uh, like um, a positive family history. Uh, and then you should ask if, the, if there is other system affection, like if you have a patient who is a congenital limb deficiency, you need to know if he has like congenital heart disease, renal genesis or anything of of, uh, of uh, this uh, associations so uh, you should ask the patient if or you ask the parents if they are seeing other specialities if they are seeing the ophthalmology for example for um any uh ophthalmological problems if they are seeing any other specialty endocrinology pediatric neurology and all these kind of things and then when it comes to examination, for any pediatric case, uh, you should examine the patient from the tip to the toe. So in other cases, if, if you, for example, we have a hip case, so you usually discuss examination of the hip. And then uh, after discussing examination of the hip, you mentioned roughly, you, you mentioned briefly the rest of the general examination, but in peds, it's better to have a system in your mind, whatever the case, to try and check on these kind of things. So we're starting from tip to toe. So you mentioned about examination of the head. So in the head, you look for any abnormal facies, that the patient have any syndromic facies, does he have, or he, she have uh, any abnormal shape of the head, like a plagiocephaly, microcephaly, you look at the eyes, is there any evidence of blue sclera that can point out to Osteogenes imperfecta? You look at the development of the teeth and um, uh, yeah, all, all, all these things. Um, and then in every pediatric case, you should um, check the spine and you do quick neurological examination. And don't forget to examine the upper limb and in the lower limb, you should um, look for any evidence of coronal or sagittal plane deformity. You look for any rotational abnormality. You look for any limb length discrepancy. So to resume that, it's, it's in every pediatric case, you should say, I will look for the face. I will look for any abnormal facies. Uh, you will look for, uh, I will, I need to examine the spine. Uh, I will look for any neurological deficit. I will, I have to examine the upper limb. I examine the lower limb. I will look for any coronal sagittal plane deformity, any rotational profile abnormality, any limb limb discrepancy. Regarding investigations, uh, it's according to each condition. Sometimes you do X-rays, CTs, MRIs. But my advice in pediatric cases always ask for more views because. As we mentioned earlier, if you are seeing a patient who have like um, a lower limb deficiency, so he may have a, a, a associated condition in the upper limb, he may have associated condition in the spine. And whenever you are suspecting something like that, please ask for more investigations. And if you are, if you have a case like, for example, is um, abnormality to the ankle, then you have to check the whole leg. Okay. So next, you're going to speak about embryology. So I have a problem, please. Uh, 
Okay, so let's start. So we all know that empiriology is just a hard bit. You know, it's like a dry topic and I usually find it difficult. So what I will try and do today, I'll try and make it as simple as I can. Um, so we usually the limpod and baryogenesis starts between the age of four to eight weeks and it starts at outgrowth of mesoderm into the overlying ectoderm so if this is the embryo so this is the mesoderm and the black line that is covering it is the ectoderm okay the mesoderm that outgrow and form the limb part is formed of two types two layers of mesoderm the first is somatic mesoderm that will give rise to the muscle tissue later on and the lateral plate mesoderm, mesoderm that will give rise to the bone and cartilage okay so when we describe the development of the limb part we usually describe it in um, three axes and each axis has a different molecular pathway and to be honest these I know that it's a bit difficult and it's a bit difficult to memorize the name of the genes and the axes and everything but it does come up in the exam it does come up as an MCQ in the first part and um, it's, it can be asked you know in the second part in the Viva and the basic science table okay so uh, the first axis is the proximal to distal axis. So the proximal to distal axis growth of the limb bud is organized by the epical ectodermal ridge. So this epical ectodermal ridge is a thickening of the ectoderm overlying the mesoderm of the limb bud. It secretes fibroblast growth factor, and this fibroblast the fibroblast growth factor stimulate the underlying mesodermal cells to differentiate into specific types of cells that give the limb bud its shape uh, eventually. The effect of removal of the epical ectodermal ridge is growth arrest of um, the limb bud, which will um, present later as a congenital amputation of the limb or a transverse deficiency. Uh, so we can see on this photograph, this is an example of a congenital amputation or transverse deficiency of the limb bud, and it resulted from uh, removal of the epical ectodermal ridge or damage to the epical ectodermal ridge due to whatever reason. Uh, if you have ectopic implantation of the epical ectodermal ridge, it will cause extra limb, it's not a common kind of thing to see. Uh, here you can see an example of that where you can see the two feet are growing in a one of them is because the part of the cells of the epical ectodermal ridge are implanted uh, far away from it, where it should be. Um, so the epical ectodermal ridge after a while will have inter interdigital necrosis and this will result in the separation of the fingers or the toes. If this fails to happen, this will result in syndactly. Here an example, um, it's a clinical photograph of the foot where you can see there is syndactly in, in the second and third toes. So basically, um, in the exam, you, you, in the basic science table, we can get any of these pictures um, so if you see any of these pictures, don't panic because you will not be asked about this specific condition, but all the discussion will go into where the limb part develops. And uh, I have to say that this picture with a transverse deficiency of the limb actually is a picture that I had in my exam. So, uh, now we we'll speak about the second axis, it's the anteroposterior axis. So if you, if, you, if you look at the picture on the right hand side of the screen, so this is the embryo and this is the limb bud and this is this square is just the magnification of the limb bud. So um, oh, let me find out. So from what we can see here, 
the limb part has anterior border and posterior border. So it's a quite confusing because this anterior border will give rise to the radial side of the forearm later on. And this posterior border will give rise to the ulnar border of the, of the forearm. Uh, so this, uh, this anteroposterior axis development is regulated by the zone of paralyzing activity. So cells, so cells on the posterior aspect of the limb part get thickened and active and regulate the differentiation into anterior and posterior axis. So this is regulated by the sonic hedgehog gene and the Indian hedgehog gene. Uh, to make things more complex, so the sonic hedgehog gene also contribute to proximal to distal limb bud development through a feedback loop to the epical ectodermal ridge. So you can see that on the right hand side of the screen. So this is the, the epical ectodermal ridge. This is the zone of polarizing activity on the posterior border of the limb bud. So the epical ectodermal ridge regulate proximal to distal growth through secretion of the fibroblast growth factor. And you can see that the zone of paralyzing activity secrete or activate the sonic hedgehog gene, which um, regulate the development of the limb bud in the anteroposterior axis. And this regulate again, the proximal to distal uh, development through a negative um, feedback loop. Transplantation of the zone of paralyzing activity from posterior to anterior aspect will cause mirrored duplication of the ulnar aspect of the hand. I know that it's it's a bit tough, but we have to go through it. Uh, let's continue. So this is the last axis. So it's dorsal to ventral axis. So growth through the dorsal and ventral aspect or differentiation into dorsal and ventral aspect is regulated by the wingless type signaling pathway and it comes from the dorsal ectoderm. Uh, so this signaling pathway induces the underlying mesoderm to develop characteristics of the dorsal structures. And because the activity of this pathway is blocked vent on the ventral aspect, so this will allow the ventral mesoderm to differentiate into um, ventral structures. Um, so the WNT pathway also contributes to regulation of the SHH gene. And this reflects the complex interaction and coordination among the 3D pathways responsible for limb development. So on the pictures on the bottom of the screen, we can see that um, this is the dorsal aspect where we have the WNT gene active, and this is the apical ectodermal ridge, where we have the fibroblast growth factor, and this is the posterior border, where we have the SHH gene. And if you, and you can draw um, like a simple drawing like uh, this one, it, it can help you memorize these kind of things. So I hope that no, no, no one of you guys now is covering um, his eyes regarding the rest of the teaching today. Uh, we'll go to things that are more clinical and you'll find it more interesting. So for congenital limb deficiency, we will start by congenital femoral deficiency. So congenital femoral deficiency is the new term and it now replaced proximal femoral focal deficiency because it includes a wider spectrum of pathology. So uh, demographics of um, congenital femoral deficiency. So the incidence, it's, 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 it's a pretty rare. So it's one case in every 50,000 um, uh, people. The male to female ratio is one to two. It's usually unilateral in 85 to 90% of the cases. So it's rarely bilateral. When unilateral, the right femur is usually more, most commonly affected. It can be diagnosed by uh, in utero ultrasounds where they can measure the length of the femur uh, to reflect on the 
gestational age. So in case of discrepancy between two, th two, two sides or in case discrepancy of both femora regarding the rest of the uh, milestone that are measured with in, in neutral ultrasound, we can make an earlier diagnosis. So as we have mentioned earlier, so congenital femoral deficiency is a spectrum of disease. So it starts from having a normal but slightly short femur to having a femur with just abnormal neck shaft angle uh, to a femur with severe coxavera and sometimes the, the, or the, the second step in the spectrum is having pseudoarthrosis of the proximal femur or at the end of the spectrum, you'll have a complete absence of the proximal femur, and this is called proximal femoral focal deficiency. So the, the term congenital femoral deficiency reflects better the whole spectrum of disease. Uh, so let's start. So I want to mention about the non-femoral structures Sorry, just a second. The non-femoral structures that are also involved in congenital femoral deficiency. So whenever you have a case of congenital femoral deficiency, you have to look at the limb from starting from the acetabulum down to the toes, because as we have mentioned earlier, lots of congenital deformities can be associated together. So you first look at the acetabulum, so the acetabulum is usually dysplastic. And if it is dysplastic, so it's usually, the, the acetabular dysplasia is usually progressive, which means that with time it gets worse. And this is contrary to what we see in DDH, where with growth, the acetabulum grow and become deeper and remodel into a better acetabular index. Uh, then if you look at the side, usually you have muscle hypoplasia. Some of the muscles are absent. Some of the muscles are hypoplastic. Some of the muscles are um, contracted. And you have to assess that on a case-by-case -case basis. The other thing is the blood vessels and neurovascular bundle is not in its usual um, anatomical landmark. So it can be displaced medially, laterally. So whenever you do surgery, you should be aware of that. And um, if we come down to the knee, so the knee can have a spectrum of disorders um, in cases of congenital femoral deficiency. So the patient may have hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle, and this will present as uh, genuvalgum. The patient may have patellar hypoplasia or may have cruciate ligament dysplasia or absence of the cruciates. If we look at the tibia and the fibula, we look for any tibial hemimelia, fibular hemimelia. And on the ankle, we should look for any evidence of tarsal coalition. In case of any tarsal coalition, the patient may have a bowl and socket joint where the top of the talus is uh, acting like the bowl and the, the rest of the, of the ankle or the mortis is acting like a socket. And the reason of having bowl and socket joint because the subtalar joint is fused so the ankle joint will take over and do the function of all the joints of the foot so to take the shape of the ball and socket joint to give a wide range of movement um in, in, in a 3d kind of thing then we have to look at the foot in the foot you look for any absent rays you look for any evidence of syntactly and then as we have mentioned earlier don't forget to look at the other side don't forget to look at the upper limb, look for any ulnar deficiency, which is the most commonly associated deformity in the upper limb. Um, and you look for any other deformities in the upper limb, like synestosis between the radius and the ulnar, radial hemimelia. You look for any finger abnormalities, you, look, you examine the shoulder, you should examine all to the spine and look for any um, evidence of spine disease, like uh, congenital scoliosis. So you have to look to the limb as a whole, and by looking to the limb as a whole, then you will uh, complete the puzzle and reach the diagnosis at the end.
Okay. So uh, we we were speaking about how to approach a case. So when you whenever you have a case of congenital femoral deficiency, then you start with history taking, as we have mentioned earlier. You start with examination. So if you keep the 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 other deformities that we have we have mentioned here. So this will be the basis of the clinical examination. Will be the basis of um, the investigation that we will go for later on. So in examination, don't forget to examine for limb lens discrepancy. So these patients have limb lens discrepancy. So uh, you should uh, assess how much limb lens discrepancy they have. And roughly, can you can say, I can see that the limb is severely short and the ankle joint is below or above the level of the knee joint on the other limb. Okay. Then you have to examine the hip and see if there is any contractures in the hip, if there is any flexed flexion deformity. Um, you examine for the range of movement and then you examine the knee. You look for any contractures, you look for any uh, patellofemoral disorder, you look for any limb deficiency, you look for any um, deformity, and then you examine the ankle, and again, you look for any contracture, deformity, examine the range of movement, and it's very important to examine stability of the ankle as well. So we'll come back to each joint. So for the hip, look for any contracture, like external rotation contracture, fixed flexion deformity, do the Thomas test as you do in adults, Look for a tibial band contracture, do the over test. Uh, if there is decreased abduction, this could be due to coxavera. For the knee, look for any fixed flexion deformity, look for any junior valgum that will be associated with lateral femoral condyle hypoplasia, look for any ligament plaxty. Examine the patellofemoral joint, look for any hypoplastic patella, look for any patellofemoral mal tracking. These patients may have small patella and may have congenital patella dislocation. Examine the knee, look for any meniscal clunk. They may have discoid meniscus. In the ankle, look for any evidence of equinus. It, you have to comment if the ankle is in varus or vulgus. If the ankle looks normal, you should comment on any stability. Is it unstable in vulgus or varus? Um, the ankle itself may look normal, but may have decreased dorsiflexion due to abnormality on the distal tibular articular surface. Look at the level of the lateral malleolus. It may be more proximal than the medial malleolus or at the same level, which is again is no is abnormal. And again, you look at the foot, you look for any absent rays, you look for any syntactly. And don't forget the other things that we have mentioned earlier. So look for the other limb, look for the upper limb, look for the spine, do a neurological examination. And then for imaging, we should have a full length anteroposterior standing legs with the patella pointing forward. And if there is a limb, uh, limb lens discrepancy, you can use a block to better balance the pelvis and will help with this full length x-ray to be most accurate. Uh, we can get a full limb um, lateral x-ray in maximum extension to look for any flexion deformities. You can get a pelvis anteroposterior x-ray in supine position and check the acetabular index. You look for ossification of the femoral head. So the acetabular index, as we can see on the right hand uh, screen, we can see it, it's measured between the Helgen line and line and a line along the um, roof of the acetabulum. It's normally around 20 degrees. So you can, you can ask for an MRI scan and the role of MRI scan is to look for any proximal femoral femur that is not, is not ossified. 
So if, if the proximal femur does not show up in the x-ray, this means that it could be a cartilaginous and not ossified as yet, or could be deficient. So the MRI will help with that. And look for any, um, you can ask for MRI scan of the knee to look for any congenital ligament deficiency. Uh, CT scan has a lower role actually, but you can you can ask for MRI scan in uh, older kids to look for to assess the acetabulum and the pelvis. Okay, so classifications classification is a bit difficult. Don't worry if you if you can't memorize it fully. We will go through it. But uh, yeah, again, I, I know it's a bit complex, but it it guides the treatment. So it would be better if you have just an idea about it. So these are historical classifications. They are not used anymore. So first, the Aitken classification, and done in the nineteen fifty nine. So it's basically. Um, classify the congenital femur deficiency into um, those with good acetabulum and these are A or B and those with poor acetabulum that are C and D and this uh, is subclassified into A or B according to the appearance of the proximal femur. Uh, Papas in 1983 uh, made it a bit more complex but again it does not dictate how, how, what, which treatment you're going to give the patient. So again, it's not in use right now. Uh, yeah, so all these classifications are not satisfactory. The mostly used classification right now is the Paley classification and it's done in the 1998. So uh, for type one, so type one has intact femur and the hip and the knee are normal and mobile, okay? And for type 1, it is subclassified into 1A, where the patient will have normal ossification of the proximal femur. But the abnormality in 1A could be in the neck shaft angle, could be the whole femur slightly short. The neck shaft angle could be in varus, could be in retrovirgin. And in type B, the femur is well formed but there is delayed ossification of the proximal femur and delayed ossification could be either only in the neck or could extend to the subtrochanteric area or could be combined neck and subtrochanteric types. So this is type 1a as we can see in this picture so the femur is normally formed but is slightly shorter than it should be. In type 1b the proximal femur is still cartilaginous with delayed ossification. So, and then type two, type two has mobile pseudoarthrosis. Um, so the, the greater trochanter apophysis is usually present and the knee is usually mobile. So um, just to differentiate between 1B and type two. So in 1B, the proximal femur is formed, but is still cartilaginous, and there is delayed ossification of the proximal femur. But in type 2a, there is missing part in the proximal femur, and this missing part is called pseudoarthrosis, where the, 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 these two parts of the femur are connected with fibrous tissue with no cartilage, no bone connection between these two. Uh, and again, so type 2 is subclassified into type 2a, where the femoral head is mobile in the acetabulum, type 2b, where the femoral head partially fused to the acetabulum, and type c, where the femoral head and the acetabulum are com completely fused or could be absent. Don't worry about the subclassification, but now we know that type 2 is a type where the proximal femur has pseudoarthrosis and part of the femur these two parts of the femur are not connected. Type three is a severe type where the patient will have diaphyseal deficiency of the femur, but the greater to, uh, the greater to apophysis is absent. So this is how to differentiate type three from type two. Um, so again, it's subclassified into three A where the distal physis is at there and the knee motion is more than 45 degrees, or type B where the distal physis is there, but the knee motion is less than 
45 degree. Uh, and type C is complete deficiency of distal femur or fusion of the distal femur remnant to the tibia. Again, I would say don't, don't, don't make things complex, guys. You don't have to memorize the, um, the subtypes of type 3. In type 4, there is distal deficiency of the femur, but the proximal end is normal, as we can see on this uh, photograph here. So we speak generally about the principles of surgical treatment. Okay. So the step one in treatment. So if we say we have a short limb, so in order to lengthen the limb, you should have a stable hip and stable knee. Because if you don't have a stable joint above and stable joint below, you can't lengthen the femur. If you lengthen the femur while well, there is arth like pseudoarthrosis in the proximal femur, so the limb will not will not um, grow will not increase in length. But what will happen is the proximal femur will continue to migrate proximally um, at the site of the pseudoarthrosis. So step one in management will be to stabilize the hip and stabilize the knee in case they are unstable. If they are stable, then you will skip step one and go to step two. So how, how do you stabilize the hip? So at the age two to three years, you should go for um, operations to stabilize the hip. So the principles of management will be to release any contractures, if there is any contracture of the flexors, the aviodactors, the iliotibial band, you have to lengthen those. Uh, if there is any proximal femoral deformity, you have to do proximal femoral osteotomy to correct the varus, the retrovagin, the external rotation. If there is acetabular dysplasia, you have to do pelvic osteotomy to correct the acetabular dysplasia. Um, if you do all these steps, this is called super hip procedure. Uh, so this is an example of a super hip procedure where we, a proximal femoral osteotomy is done together with a pelvic osteotomy to correct the acetabular dysplasia. And the osteotomy is fixed with a screw along the neck. So the, the aim of this crew is to encourage the ossification of the proximal femur that is whole cartilaginous at that age. And they put a rush pin in the rush pin pen inside an intramedullary and augment this with um, a figure, figure of eight tension band wire. However, this, this kind of operation ended up with complications. So the most common complications was recurrent virus of the proximal femur and delayed ossification of the proximal femur. And since these operations, these kind of um, complications are reported frequently, the, sur the surgery developed into this new techniques of surgery. So to avoid the recurrent virus, we shifted to using fixed angle plate, either pediatric DHS or a plate plate or a proximal femoral looking plate. And to enhance ossification of the proximal femur, you can add bone morphogenic protein into the proximal femur through a separate drill hole on top of the plate, as we can see here. When you mentioned, so this is an example. So you can see on the left-hand side, the proximal femur is not ossified. But with MRI scan was confirmed that the proximal femur is still is there and it's cartilaginous. Um, so, um, and, and the, the neck shaft angle is in severe varus. So, uh, and then we can see here that um, the varus is corrected and is fixed with a fixed angle blade plate and Bone morphogenic protein was added through a separate drill hole on top of the plate plate. And we can see on the right here how the proximal femur now ossified and maintained the neck shaft angle. So when you be careful when you mention about the bone morphogenic protein. Uh, in the exam because it's not FDA approved for use in children. So it's used in children in an off-label fashion 
and it's used in other indications like in pseudoarthrosis, tibia, and tibial hemimelia. Um, the reason why it's not it's not FDA approved for use in children because it it has a theoretical risk of oncogenesis, particularly in pediatric cases. They believe that it induces the mesenchymal cells to transform into uh, cells with malignant potential. However, this is a theoretical risk. It's not proved by a clinical study. And as we all know, um, it's used in adults for spinal fusion to decrease the risk of pseudoarthrosis. And, and there is an evidence, uh, uh, I quoted the reference here, um, where they prove that it doesn't cause any increased risk of cancer. So we, we summarized how you stabilize the hip and we will um, speak about how you stabilize the knee. So basically the most common associated ligament deficiency is cruciate ligament deficiency. But even in those who have cruciate ligament deficiency, they tend not to have clinical anthroposterior instability. So even if there is isolated anthroposterior instability in, in, in the knee, it's not necessarily an indication to do knee ligament reconstructive surgery in children with congenital femoral deficiency. The surgery can be done at the adolescence if it is symptomatic. Um, so if you have severe instability where there is no endpoint, then you can argue that you can do extra articular like Macintosh procedure to reconstruct the anterior cruciate ligament. Um, and during lengthening, you should be careful because when you lengthen the femur, if there is associated cruciate ligament deficiency, this can cause progressive subluxation of the knee. So you have to spam the knee and add the ring of the external fixator um, at the proximal tibia and put hinges at the knee level. So here's an example. So we can see here on the x-ray that the femur on the right side is shorter than the femur um, on the left side. Okay, so this was lengthened uh, via an external fixator over nail. And we can see that there is um, a ring spanning the knee to avoid progressive subluxation of the knee. And we can see the clinical photograph here where this, this ring at the knee below the knee level is attached to the main external fixator with hinges, which will allow the patient to do range of movement and avoid knee stiffness. Okay, now we move to step two in the management. So we mentioned that step one will be stabilize the hip, stabilize the knee, and then step two will be serial lengthening of the femur and the tibia if needed. So the first step to plan your lengthening is to predict the total limb length discrepancy at skeletal maturity. And the easiest way to do that nowadays is via the multiplier method. It's um, a smartphone mobile app that, you, that every, every person can download and use. Um, so you should aim for around two to three lengthenings. And um, in each lengthening, you lengthen the femur about five to eight centimeters. Don't worry about these numbers if you can't memorize. So the first lengthening is usually around the age three to four years. And if you apply the rule of four, then you can do one episode of lengthening every four years. Uh, so in those who are young, you can use external fixator. And in those who are approaching skeletal maturity, you can use the magnet nail. Uh, at the age of 12 to 13 years, consider epiphysiodesis of the longer limb if there is only a small amount of residual limb length discrepancy. Um, when you lengthen the femur, the complication that it could happen is a knee fixed flexion deformity. This is because stretching of the bone and stretching of the soft tissue can cause flexion deformity of the knee. You should be careful about that. Um, or when after you remove the external fixator, the patient may have bending of the regenerate at the side of the lengthening because the regenerate is usually is not as strong as the, the, the rest of the femur, or sometimes they may have refracture at the side of the regenerate. 
to avoid that, the patient should have excessive phasis therapy and be encouraged to move the knee while doing the lengthening and keep an eye on the new range of movement to, uh, to avoid flexion deformity and to avoid um, bending of the femur or reef fracture. Um, it's better either to lengthen over a nail or to put an intramedullary nail in the femur after you finish lengthening. So from what we can see here, so this is a congenitally short femur that was lengthened with external fixator and then the patient presented with a fracture. The fracture could happen either at the pin site or at the site of the regenerate. So um, this is an example. So you can see here, there's a congenital short, congenital femoral deficiency. There is pseudoarthrosis in the proximal femur. And this is a long leg P. And we can see here after doing the super hip procedure. So this pseudoarthrosis healed and the deformity in the femur corrected with a good neck shaft angle and good acetabular index. And then uh, the patient had his first episode of lengthening. Uh, we can see that the limb length discrepancy, the femur is longer than this picture. And this is the last episode of lengthening. And we can see that the external fixator crossed the knee with a ring below the knee level to avoid knee subluxation. So step three, as we have mentioned earlier, it's either hemiepiphysiotesis or complete epiphysiotesis. So you can do contralateral epiphysiotesis around the knee uh, as an adjunct to equalize the limb length discrepancy or epilaterally. You can do hemiepiphysiotesis if the patient has got a valgus deformity of the knee. So this is an, another example. So this patient had a super hip procedure and then had lengthening with external fixator. And we can see here uh, a ring crossing the knee to avoid subluxation of the knee. And after removal of the external fixator, um, an intramedullary rod was inserted to avoid fracture at the regenerate site. And this is the last episode of lengthening and is done by a magnet nail. And because this patient developed or had a valgus knee deformity, so on the same x-ray, you can see there is eight plate on the medial side of the femur to correct the knee valgus deformity. So what happens if the hip is non-reconstructable, like complete deficiency of the proximal femur? What are the options of management? This is a very complex situation, like we see in Paley type 3. Uh, one operation that can be done for these cases is rotationoplasty. So rotationoplasty is you rotate the whole limb 180 degree. So the knee joint will act as a hip. The ankle joint will act as a knee. And then you can attach a, prothe a prothesis uh, starting from the ankle downward. We'll see an example for that. So. Here we see, so you can see that now the whole limb is rotated 180 degree and the fibula is on the medial side now. And the, the, the femur is fused to the alien. So this is an X-ray of a Paley type three um, congenital femoral deficiency. And coincidentally, this patient has got multiple hereditary exostosis. So this is just a zoom out to the pelvis. And this is what, what, what I've been done to him. So this is rotation plasty. We can see that the whole tibia is rotated 180 degrees. The femur is fused to the ilium and um, a process is attached to the limb. So here's the pelvis x-ray. You can see the iliofemoral fusion. So this is a clinical photograph. After this operation, you can see that the patient, the, the knee joint acts as the hip and flexion of the knee uh, will, will be like flexion of the hip, but he will not have any range of abduction or adduction. And the ankle joint will act as a knee and then will attach a prosthesis. A prosthesis. The other option is to do pelvic support osteotomy. Uh, so pelvic support osteotomy is when you have deficiency of the femur, so you do an osteotomy at the level of the ischium and move the proximal femur to be touching the ischium. So 
And then it's a complex operation. I don't want to go into much detail, but it will allow the patient to do ischial weight bearing. Briefly, we'll mention about the knee and congenital limb deficiency, what you look for in, in the knee. So you look for any kind of deformity, like vulgus deformity is the most common. And the reason behind, or the cause of the vulgus deformity is when you have a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle on the distal femur, or it could have a proximal tibial origin as well when the the, the lateral part of the, proximal, of the proximal tibia is delayed on mystification. We can see on this x-ray on the right how to measure the height of the lateral femoral condyle and it's usually less if it is compared to the medial femoral condyle and it's less if it, if it is compared to the lateral femoral condyle of the other intact limb. We look for any knee instability. The patient may have hypoplasia or aplasia of the crochet ligaments, either the anterior or the anterior and posterior. Some of these patients may have fixed flexion deformity. Look for any patellofemoral joint de uh, deformity like patellar hypoplasia, lateral patellar dislocation, or trochlear dysplasia. Uh, I will mention briefly about the cruciate ligament dysplasia. So uh, this is um, a radiographic classification of uh, cruciate ligament dysplasia. You don't have to memorize the classification, but um, if we mention it briefly, then you can you can know how to look on that on the X-ray. So in type one, the patient will have hypoplastic lateral tibial spine and normal medial tibial spine. And if this is the case, so this patient will have hypoplasia of the anterior crochet ligament and normal posterior crochet ligament. So in type two, the patient will have complete absence of the lateral tibial spine and hypoplastic medial tibial spine. So this patient in type two will have complete absence of the SEL and hypoplastic PCL. In type three, where both the tibial spine are not there, so they are completely deficient, and we can see that the femoral, the femoral node is not developed as well. So this patient will have complete deficiency of the SEL and the PCL. Uh, yeah, so this is the classification school manner. So it's difficult to apply this classification before the age of six years. And the reason behind that is most of the proximal TB will be cartilaginous at that age. Uh, yeah, so then we will speak about fibular hemimelia. Uh, so fibular hemimelia is a condition where part or all of the fibular bone is either hypoplastic or dysplastic or is not there at all. And it could be associated with hypoplasia and dysplasia of the tibia. And hypoplasia, dysplasia, or aplasia of part or all of the foot. Okay. So the incidence is quite rare as well. So it happens, the incidence ranges from one in 135,000 to one in 50,000. Uh, the majority of the cases are unilateral. It's usually negative family history. Um, in patients who have bilateral fibular hemimelia, it's usually autosomal dominant. So let's, let's look at what, what problem these patients will have, and then we will think about how we sort this out surgically. So the problems in patients with, um, with fibular hemimelia are that they may have limb length discrepancy. They will have foot and ankle deformities, and this is the most important, and this will be the focus on the treatment. They may have foot and ankle deficiencies as well. They will have tibial deformity. They will have genuvolgum and knee instability. So regarding the limb length discrepancy, it could be femoral. The patient could have associated congenital femoral deficiency, could be tibial, could be coming from the foot. Uh, we discussed before, you look for any uh, knee deformity, any instability. The tibial deformity is usually anter anteromedial bowing, and the reason behind the anteromedial bowing is that the remnants of the fibula will act as a tether and prevent the tibia from growing normally. So if the tether at the site of the fibula, so it will be on the posterolateral aspect of the tibia, 
So this will cause the tibia to grow into anteromedial bowing. You may have a skin dimple at the apex of the tibial bowing, like in this case. So we can see that tibial is bowing anteromedially. There is a dimple at the apex of the tibial deformity and the ankle is in vulgus deformity. The ankle is usually unstable, and this is the most challenging part in the management of fibular hemimalia. So we can see on this photograph how the patient is standing with the ankle is in severe vulgus. And this is another photograph. And the reason behind the knee vulgus is the fibula is not there, so they lose the lateral buttress to the ankle. So the talus has nothing to support on the lateral side, so it drifts into vulgus. Classification again, we'll mention it briefly. So this is the Paley classification that is most commonly used nowadays. So in type one fibular hemimelia, the ankle joint is stable and the, the, the fibula is just slightly shorter than the other side. It's usually mild type, it may not be diagnosed and the, the limb lens discrepancy at majority is less than five centimeter. In type two, they tend to have ankle vulgus, but it's dynamic, so you can correct it passively. The fibula is usually shorter than the tibia, and they usually have a bone and socket joint, ankle joint, and they have limited dorsiflexion. Uh, in type three, there is fixed ankle equine vulgus. So it is subdivided into 3A where so, so type 3A where um, it's the ankle type. So the origin of the vulgus is coming from the ankle. The distal tibial epiphysis is in broker vitum and vulgus. Or type 3B where the origin of the vulgus is in the subtalar joint. So there is subtalar coalition that is malunited in varus and equines. And type 3C is combined ankle and subtalar type. Type 4, the ankle deformity is an equino varus, the coalition malunited in varus position, and there is associated distal tibial deformity. And differential diagnosis of this case will be club foot. Surgical treatment. So as we have mentioned before, we measure the expected limb lens discrepancy at maturity and we lengthen the tibia uh, below five centimeter, more than five centimeter in young children can cause growth inhibition. So in the femur, you can lengthen more than you can lengthen on the tibia. And again, we can apply the four year rule. So you do two to three lengthenings and you start at the age of four and you lengthen, you spread your lengthening episodes four year apart. Consider epiphysiodesis of the lung limb around adolescence, if there is associated congenital femoral deficiency, you can plan femoral lengthening either simultaneously or in a separate um, uh, sessions. Uh, you have to do a surgical plan and then you decide according to the classification. So in type one, the only problem is slight shortening of the lower limb. So you can, uh, you can plan for just tibia or fibular lengthening. You don't have to do any food fixation and the patient doesn't need any kind of food surgery. So in type two, there is um, ankle instability. And the cause of the ankle stability, as we have mentioned earlier, it, the, the fibula is short. This X-ray that is on the screen is a normal ankle X-ray in a child where the physis of the distal fibula is at the level of the ankle joint, okay? You can see here, it's, this is the X-ray of a case of fibular hemimelia where the physis of the distal tibia is at the level of the distal tibial physis. So in type two, so the fibula is short. So the way to stabilize the ankle is to shorten the tibia. So you relatively lengthen the fibula. So you do an operation called shorted operation where you do shortening realignment osteotomy of the distal tibia to correct the vulgus and stabilize the ankle. 
after this operation or together with it, the tibia can be lengthened. So this is how we do this operation. So you do a medial incision, you do a T-shaped incision in the periosteum, and then you do a small incision at the centrosmosis level. You separate the tibia from the fibula, and then you do the osteotomy. It's a biplanar osteotomy to correct the deformity in the distal tibia. And then after you do that, you shorten the tibia and you preliminary fix it with wires. And the next step, you stabilize the syndesmosis with a tight rope. And here an example. So you can see this is the, the 3D CT before the operation. And these are the x-rays. We can see that the fibula is it's short and the ankle is drifting into vulgus. And this is the interoperative image with the osteotomy and the shortening of the TV. And this is after fixation. We can see after fixation that now the physis of the distal fibula is at the level of the ankle joint. In type three and four, we do the super ankle procedure and super is not, it's, it's, it's an acronym for systemic utilitarian procedure for extremity reconstruction. So um, in type three and four, lengthening is often combined with the uh, super ankle procedure. So you do the, both at the same session. Uh, so the principle of it is, is quite similar to, to the management of um, type two. So, here, here we can see the deformity of the distal tibia. So the, the lateral distal tibial angle is less than 90 degree, and there is deformity of the anterior, uh, of, the, of, the, of the anterior lateral distal tibial angle. It's more than 90 degree, and this acts as a mechanical block for the ankle dorsiflexion. So, um, to do this, to, to do this operation, we do two long incisions on the lateral aspect of the leg, one proximal and one distal. And the first step in the operation is to remove the fibula and lug. Any remnants of the fibula should be removed because these will act as a tether for the growth of the of the tibia and cause tibial deformity. In order to do that, you have to dissect and protect the common peroneal nerve and superficial peroneal nerve distally. And then after you do that, you, you, um, you release the capsule of the ankle joint. And then you do osteotomy of the tarsal coalition. So you correct the alignment of the, the calcaneum to the, to the talus. Okay, as you can see here, to do that, you have to rotate the calcaneum and translate on the same time. And then you fix the talus in the ankle joint. And then out of that, you do shortening realignment osteotomy to the distal tibia. And this will be the, the last, uh, the, the final picture of what we have done. So it, it's a subtalar osteotomy, distal tibial osteotomy and preliminary fixation. And then you add a frame on the top. And you put this ring here to allow the patient to do weight bearing. And if you plan to do lengthening on the same session, you can do a proximal osteotomy and you can lengthen on the same operation. So here's an example. So we can see here that the ankle is in severe vulgus. There is a skin dimple at the apex of the tibial deformity. It's antromedial bowing of the tibia. We can see on this x-ray, the femur looks pretty normal as compared to the other side. We can see the antromedial bowing of the tibia, the severe vulgus of the ankle. We can see on the lateral view here that the whole bones of the ankle are fused into one single bone. So this is during the operation, osteotomy and shortening of the tibia and osteotomy uh, of the subtalar coalition and preliminary fixation with a wire. External fixator is attached with uh, lengthening. And we can see here the pictures after the lensing and here the clinical picture. Okay, so amputation. Do we do amputation for fibular hemimelia? So the, 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 when we do the amputation, the only indications for amputation, if the foot is severely deficient and the patient is unable to achieve plantigrade foot 
with reconstruction, uh, or could be a parental wish if they don't want to go through multiple extensive surgeries. In that case, um, we go for Symes amputation. So the reason we go for Symes amputation because it's more energy efficient than midfoot osteotomy. Uh, in order to do Symes amputation, the patient should have a patent posterior tibial artery because this gives a blood supply to the heel pad and the heel pad was act as a cushion to the stump. Uh, any questions? Thanks, John. Um, very comprehensive. Um, and I think reasonable, you know, you can, especially in this time of photographs for the vivas um, and the clinicals, you could easily get um, one of those cases coming up. So I think what we're going to do next is we're going to do launch the poll. We'll get you to answer as quickly as we can. And then we'll, I think we've only got one question in the chat at the moment, but we'll do the poll first, then we'll do questions and then we'll stop recording. Question is, um, so the best answer is epical ectodermal ridge and fibroblast growth factor. Uh, so we have 65% of the candidates answer correctly. Uh, the second question, um, it's almost half and half actually. So the most common foot and ankle deformity in fibular hemimelia is equino vulgus. So 47% um, answer this quickly, uh, sorry, correctly. Uh, the last question in the x-ray finding to diagnose Cruciate ligament dysplasia, actually all the answers are correct. So the correct answer will be all of the above. We have 47% answered this uh, correctly. Okay, thank you. All right, brilliant. Well done everyone. So um, in terms of questions, um, the Twiling wants to ask, pre-axial and post-axial in relation to the axis um, it's quite a confusing description. Can you explain it a bit, uh, a bit more, please? So, um, so, so in the upper limb, so, so the post-axial at the radial side and pre-axial at the ulnar side. So when you have polydactyly on the ulnar side, you know, so this is a pre-axial polydactyly. On the other side, on the radial side, it's post-axial and the same in the lower limb. Okay, so the big toe is, uh, we, we can consider that the big toe or the thumb with the axis. So on the other side, on the lateral side of it is post-axial or the other side is the pre-axial. I don't think there is like a rule for that, uh, David. Okay, that's uh, fine. I just memorize it like that, you know. That's why, does that help, I hope? Yeah, sure, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, and then Vilas um, wants to ask, if less than three toes are present, um, is there non-functional foot? Sorry, say it again. If less than three toes are present, so I presume only two toes are uh, present, is there so, non-functional foot? So this is actually a good question. So there is debate uh, regarding in what's the minimum number of rays you have in the foot to have functioning foot, okay? So, it's, because it's controversial, so some people believe that if you have less than three rays, so this foot cannot be a plantigrade foot or cannot um, like withstand the whole stresses of the body weight. But actually, this is not right because sometimes the patient may have two rays, but one of these rays actually is like a fusion of two rays. So imagine if you have a patient with on the x-ray two metatarsals, but they may have one of them is very big and actually it's like a syndactyly between the first and second metatarsal. So if clinically you can, the patient can have plantigrade foot or you feel that the size of the foot is, is enough to withstand the whole, um, the whole weight of the, of, the, of the body while walking. So this means that this limb can be reconstructed. Okay. But if you have a very small remnants of the foot that cannot be reconstructed, is an indication for, um, for for amputation, but not the, the 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 absolute number of metatarsals or toes. Okay, so it's based on the ability to be a weight bearing weight bearing yeah. ability. 
rather than the mounted ray. So if they ask, and so you're unlikely to go down that route, but should they ask, stay, uh, the candidate should say it's a controversial topic, but the key aim is whether they're able to weight bear on that foot. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Brilliant. Um, I don't, uh, there are no other questions in the chat. Um, is there anything else, that, uh, burning questions that people want to ask uh, uh, at all? Just, just one more question. I mean, what, what is the appropriate age? Can you just repeat that uh, thing again? What is the appropriate age for the operations? So for lengthening, you start at the age of four. It's very difficult, you know, to lengthen a child like at the age of two or three due to okay. uh, lots of reasons, actually. It's because the size of the limb is very small. The ability of the child to cope with an external fixator, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to convince a child that is four year old to do near range of movement to avoid knee stiffness, you know. Um, so, so basically, if if you are in in other causes of limb length discrepancy, we usually postpone the the you know the lengthening till the age of six or seven when the child is cooperative and can cope, can understand the instructions and do the physio exercises. Well, because in congenital limb deficiency, you you have to do multiple episodes of lengthening. So it's better to start early at the age of four, and then okay. you do one episode of lengthening every four year. So at four, eight, 12, and then it's better not to do, it's, it's difficult to do more than three episodes of lengthening. And if you end up having like two centimeter limb length discrepancy or three centimeter limb length discrepancy, you can do epiphysiodesis of the longer side before before skeletal maturity by one or two years, according to you calculated on the multiplier method and see when you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Other okay. operations apart from the lengthening, so you do at the age of two to three years. So if you okay. if you are going to do the super ankle you can, procedure, you can do it at the age of two to three years. You can do the super hip procedure at the age of two to three years to prepare to your lengthening at the age of four. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks, John. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, and I think